Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, lamp unto a feet, light upon our path. We ask in the moments that remain this morning that you would speak to us with tremendous clarity. Lord, that as we take notes with pen and paper, you, with your very finger, would write on the tablets of our hearts. And when we leave this place, we'll know that you have spoken, for which we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in the matchless holy name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. What do you really want in life? What do you really want? And what, are you willing to fight for it? In the introduction here, what do you really want in life? And are you willing to fight for it? Some things are worth fighting for. Other things are not. Let me say this to you as the Lord spoke to me. What you're willing to live with is what you will become. What you're willing to tolerate, what you're willing to live with, that is what you will become. That is what I will become, whatever I'm willing to tolerate, whatever I'm willing to live with. To understand the verses of Scripture that we read in your hearing, you need to understand the command that God gave the children of Israel. Again, we've been preaching along the lines of possessing the land, which, to make it plain to you, is that God wants us to fulfill everything that he has for us. There's not one thing he wants to leave undone. He's got a plan. He's got a future. He has a hope for you. He has a dream for you, for us, individually and corporately. And that is a picture of possessing the land, having what God wants us to have, being who God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do. That is a picture of possessing the land, receiving, possessing everything that God has for you planned. In the book of Numbers, to understand the gravity of these verses that we read and how grievous they are, we find in Numbers 33, verse 52 to 56, this command. Drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols. And demolish all their high places. Take possession of the land. Everybody say that. Take possession of the land and settle in it. For I've given you the land to possess. Distribute the land by lot according to your clans. To a larger group, give a larger inheritance. To a smaller group, give a smaller one. Whatever falls to them by lot will be theirs. Distribute it according to ancestral tribes. Verse 55. Put that up on the screen if you can. Numbers 33, verse 55. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. And they will give you trouble in the land and wherever you live. My, my, my. A command is given. As you're filling in your notes, a command is given to drive out all the inhabitants of the land. So when you see that command given and then you then read Joshua how they didn't do it, I got the title of today's message and really the word of the Lord from my shirt yesterday as I was, I had a new shirt I was wearing. Hopefully it's going to look good in the pictures I got with the moose and the rainbow and all that. But as I looked, as I looked down at my shirt, it's one of those cool ones that hang out, you know, you don't tuck those kind in. It'll probably be fading out of, of uh, you know, fad will probably fade away in about three or four or five years and we'll be back to belts and tucking your shirt in. Anyway, I looked on the edge of my shirt and it said, no more excuses, get it done. And I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> no more excuses, get it done. I've titled the message, get it done. This command to drive out all the inhabitants and to utterly destroy all the idols. And a warning is given that if you don't do that, then there are going to be a thorn in your side and barbs in your eyes. They'll cause you trouble. Let me read this, this verse of Scripture out of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3. Do not intermarry them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. 
And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. However, the cities of the nations the Lord God is giving you as an inheritance do not leave alive anything that breathes. Well, that's pretty pointed. If anything's breathing, kill it. That means cattle. That means, I mean, that means everything. Utterly destroy them all. And so when you read this, is complete, verse 17, completely destroy them. Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites. Gosh, that's so violent, Lord. God will judge Israel if they were not to do it. And so when you understand that, and you read the verses of Scripture that we just read, it's a sad, sad thing. It's a grievous we grieve over the statement they did not drive out the Canaanites. And in the studying of this passage, and even this morning, I'm reminded of many people throughout the, the years of ministry and serving the Lord that I've got a few years under my belt. And if you've served the Lord for any length of time, you will see people come to the Lord and they get saved, even gloriously. I don't mean crocodile tears. I mean for real. They got saved. But they refuse to deal with certain aspects of their life. They refuse to drive out the Canaanites. And so they live a mixture of truth, loving the Lord, attempting to love the Lord with all their heart. But when God puts his finger on things inside their, about their thinking or inside their heart and things that they're doing, that's going to destroy them. And he encourages us, even lovingly, to push it out, to drive it out, to kill every demonic thing that breathes, if we could just say it that way, every thought, every high and lofty thought that's raised up against the knowledge of God, to tear those things down. And when we don't do that, when we don't do that, I will tell you what I've seen. As your pastor, I've seen it here for the past eight years. I've pastored before that, been pastoring for, oh, I don't know, about 15, something like that. Been saved for about 20. I've seen people absolutely get derailed and wasted and the reason is they would not submit to the word of the lord they would not submit to the spirit of god that would speak to them and say you correct this deal with it and they wouldn't they allowed canaanites to dwell in their heads and they ended up they ended up with barbs in their eyes they lost their vision and they ended up with a, a thorns in their side, all kinds of physical things, Pastor? Yes, physical things too, all kinds of problems. That's not God's intention. It's God's intention for us to lay hold of all of his promises to possess the land. Amen. Why didn't they drive them out? Why didn't Israel drive out the, the, those that were squatters, really? And what now you say... How could God be so mean to those Amorites? Well, look, they, God gave them a chance, and you can see that he was patient with them, but their sin reached a fullness. And there comes a time when, when the Lord lovingly brings judgment upon you. I said lovingly brings judgment upon you. Yeah, there comes that time. I mean, you, David said, I long for your judgments. Oh, you're, you're not understanding what I'm telling you. God loves you so much that he'll smite that thing that's going to that's gonna lead you astray and cause you to be derailed and cause you to end up putting barbs in your eyes and a thorn in your side. He'll, he'll, he'll make sure things fail. He'll, he'll, he'll help you. Lauren Cunningham, who's a friend of our ministry, how many of you know who Lauren Cunningham is? He, he had for years on his computer a little, a little sign that says, those whom the Lord loves, he beats the hell out of. Say, oh. Yeah, how many of you know that if you have some hell on the inside of you, it'd probably be good to get rid of that, amen? Why didn't they drive them out? Now, now keep in mind that as we read this, this verses of Scripture here in, in Joshua, that God was still with them. And they were the same army, army that defeated their enemies before. They had defeated some 30-plus kings. I mean, I mean, we're talking the army of God. Marching on the land, and then you see this statement, they could not drive them out. Like, how's that? How is it that they couldn't drive them out? Has anybody, uh, you ever hired somebody? Or I, I'll just, I'll say it this way. I remember being hired before I had some character. 
and I was paid before I actually did the work. And when I was paid before I did the work, I just kind of wanted to get it done a little bit faster. Kind of just, don't look at me like that. I, I, I didn't do as good a job. I'm mean, I'm talking when I was a kid. I mean, you know, I might cut some corners. But I'm like, oh, I got paid already, man. You know, when you're hiring a contractor to build your house or do something like that, you know, you never generally, you know, you don't want to pay them all up front. But that's exactly what happened. Now, I know there's honest contractors, especially in this house, and we thank God for you all. But it's just bad business practice to pay for everything before you get it. It keeps everybody accountable. Can I, can I just save my counseling department some problems as well as the pain and suffering that we've experienced? I don't care if somebody's walking on water, tongue talking, casting out devils. You do a deal with them, you sign a contract. Can somebody say amen? Yeah. Okay, good. You do a deal with anybody, write it up and sign it. Why? Because he said, she said, and so did the fence post, and nobody can ever figure out anything. That's not what I said. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. No, I didn't. No. Oh, oh you sinner. You let me love God. Oh. They, were, they received their inheritance. They were given their inheritance before actually utterly driving them out. And I think they wanted to enjoy it without finishing the job. I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm reading between the lines. I think that's what happened. One thing for sure, they didn't finish the job. We know that because it says they didn't finish it. And so when the task was hard, instead of having a breakthrough, they decided to accommodate their problems. And I have seen this in people's life over and over and over and over and over again. Don't accommodate problems. Deal with things head on. Enjoy confrontation. I used to, I, hey, I used to, I used to really want to avoid confrontation at all costs. And then I heard a message a long time ago, and you'll hear me quote it from time to time. And it was a pastor that said this, and I was a, I was a, a life small group leader in our church, and the pastor said this, a guest speaker. He said, if you don't confront things in your life, you will have the devil running your life. And he said, if you don't confront things in the church, you'll have the devil running your church. And I thought, okay, awesome. We're not going to have the devil at the wheel anymore. We did that, did, been there, done that, time to confront some stuff. And you're going to learn to confront things in love, especially when you're dealing with people. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. And I think they just didn't confront things. They didn't have a breakthrough. They decided to accommodate their problems. Listen, some of you are accommodating stuff. Some of you are accommodating things that are going to be a barb in your eye and a thorn in your side. And you need to take that thing by the, you need to take that bull by the horns. In Jesus' name, take authority over that and believe for breakthrough. Don't just tolerate it. I just heard an amen somewhere. I think they lacked faith is the other reason. They, they, they lacked faith. And Joshua 17 we, we read that, Joshua 17, verse 16 and 17. Josh says, man, they've got iron chariots, but you can do it. You can finish it. You can get her done. Come on, somebody say, get her done. Yeah. You can get her done. How to not stop until you get her done. How to not stop until you finish, until you possess the land. How to not do that. Here's some very, princes, very simple principles. First of all, keep in mind, God has given you victory. Everybody go victory. I know some of you born in the 60s, this peace sign, this victory today. Everybody say victory. Okay, say it three times. Make it count. Ready? One, two, three. Victory, victory, victory. Say it like you mean it one more time. Victory, victory. It is God's intention, God's plan that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. He has given us his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. He enables us. He empowers us to get the job done. He enables us and empowers us to live a victorious life. Turn to Romans. Book of Romans. Chapter 8. God has promised you victory. God has promised me victory. I've been a pile of tears at times in my life on the carpet in intercession, just quoting this very scripture I'm about to read to you. No matter what you're facing, no matter how big or how bad the iron chariots are, that's what they're saying. Hey, Josh, they got iron chariots, man. And we have, we have bronze, iron, bronze, Iron trumps bronze, Josh. 
We got a problem. They forgot. It was a generation that didn't, didn't see Egypt get taken out. It's a whole new generation. But they did see the Jordan part. They did see manna. They did see the walls of Jericho fall flat. They did see things like that. But somehow, I mean, it's almost like you're, you're talking to their parents or something. Oh, we can't do it. <laughs> Last time I checked, nothing's impossible with God. So what my Bible says, Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? For God is for us who can be against us. He who did not spare his own son. Bump your neighbor and say, listen up. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How we not also along with him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God, also making intercession for us. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or iron chariots? When I said iron chariots, I'm referring back to Joshua. In other words, nothing, nothing can separate you. Verse 36. For it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. The devil is a created being. The devil's a created being. He's not uncreated. He's not the opposite of God. That's Zoroastrianism for all of you theologians out there. That's not what the Bible says. He, the, Satan is a created being, and one day he's going to be uncreated, one angel with one chain, going to wrap it around his ugly, horny-toted tail and toss him in the lake of fire, and it'll be over. His days are numbered. So it does not matter what you face all the days of your life. If it's an obstacle, you can run through it or jump over it. It doesn't matter what sickness or infirmity or disease you might be facing. It doesn't matter what kind of confusion or you might be perplexed. Whatever you face all of your life, God will give you victory, victory, victory. Can you say amen? amen? You've got to settle that. And I think they forgot. How not to stop until you get her done? Remember, it is victory for you, for me, for us. Read the back of the book, we win. You just need to walk it out. And keep in mind that you are the key to your future. I'm the what? You're the key. You are the key to your future. What do you mean by that? I remember years and years ago, I was belly aching and moaning about how I didn't have enough and how people didn't understand me and how I didn't have the right, you know, the right wisdom and I didn't have the right situation. If so and so and would do this and that, then I'd be able to. I mean, I had more excuses. I was just a full on victim. I mean, every, I was just, oh, God, oh, I'm never going to make it. And the Lord just, just hauled off and lovingly cracked me. He said, son, you're a victor, not a victim. I'm a what? You're a victor, not a victim. Stop it. He began to show me who he was. And then he said, who I am and who you are in me changes everything. You're a victor. And I began to, I didn't even hardly believe that, but it was so real and so loud in my heart. I would just look myself in the mirror and go, you're a victor. And I started declaring that. You know what began to happen? I started winning. And it didn't really matter what other people did. Didn't, I mean, I mean I criticized and all kinds of stuff. I had all kinds of things happen. People would fail. People are going to fail you. And I realized that I was my own worst enemy. 
And I try to even, man, the devil, I think sometimes he gets a bad rap. People blame him all the time. Actually, it's them. But you need to understand, understand this insight. Back to your notes. Satan's power is parasitical. His power is parasitical. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever had lice. I don't have a problem with lice because I don't have any hair. So, don't worry, no head lice, they, they don't come around my name, neck of the woods. Amen. <laughs> lice are parasites. They need to have a host. That is the way that demon power works. You have to come in agreement. You have to allow him to live in your land, if I can say it that way. But you've been given rights. You've been given the authority to evict him. But many people, they, they, they don't, or they forget, or they just say, oh, God, you're sovereign, Lord, would you please help me? You know, Jesus died on a cross, rose again from the grave. It says in the Bible, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatsoever will be loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's given you the firepower. That's like going bear hunting with a gun, and then you start getting charged, and you're like, Lord, help me. He's like, it's loaded. Use the gun. Use the gun. Use the gun. Use the gun. He's like, Lord, won't you help? <laughs> These people hide under their beds while they're being mauled. When they have the power of the name of Jesus, they have the authority of the name of Jesus, he, they have their word, they have the spirit, and all they need to do is stand up and take their prophetic finger and say, uh -uh. Go, in Jesus' name. Everybody say go. They use, they use an understanding of authority as inaction. For inaction, we just hope that God's going to save them. But he, he already gave you the gun. He gave you his name. He gave you authority. Use it. Your faith will release. Faith in God will release God's power. Faith in God will release God's power. And three, I, I already just preached it to you. What you bind is bound. What you loose is loosed. Right out of the book of Matthew. And four, as we bring this to a conclusion, you can't control everything that happens to us, but you can certainly control yourself and control the outcome. You can't control people. I know people that try to do that. They have issues. We have a counseling department. If you have a problem with controlling, then you just come and we'll help you. Amen. You can be set free. Well, that went over real well. It's true. So, I mean, some, some folks, you know, maybe not here, but some folks control other people with anger, fear, manipulation, intimacy. Well, if you don't do what I want, then that's it for you. You're cut off. All right, you might get that on the way home. I'm just telling you that you can't control other people, but you can control your response. You can respond because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. and You can do the right thing. I've found out many times when I've prayed for God to intervene in situations, He changes me. He just changes me. I want Him to like, you know, bring fire down or do something else. And He says, yeah, actually, son, you're the one that needs to become more like me. I'm like, oh, yeah, Christ-likeness. Look at C, final point. Keep in mind that we have weapons. We have the weapons you need to win. And I love that about the Lord. I'm to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And if you'd put it on the screen, please. I love that about the Lord, that when He sends us out downrange, when He sends us downrange, He doesn't send you with a pea shooter. He doesn't send you with lint in your pockets hoping that you can just rub a nickel together or something to hope that it can happen. He sends you with power, with authority. Now, some of you are convicted and some of you are you're like, well, you got Jebusite. Jebusitis. Living in your head. You've got, we got that scripture? Go ahead and throw it up. You got strongholds. You got the New Testament application is we've allowed for thought patterns 
to remain when the Lord told us to tear them down through his word. We, we, we know what truth is because his word is truth and he's given us the spirit of truth. Can you put that up? There it is. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary. In other words, the weapons we fight with are not tanks. They're not talking about the war and the natural. Chaplain just came back from, from being downrange. God bless you. Prayed a lot for you. Prayed for you. Praise God. Home sweet home. There's still guys out there. And it's getting thicker. We need to pray for our military. It's not talking about that kind of weaponry. Well, that's important. That's powerful. Amen. It says the weapons we fight with are not the weapons on the world of the world. Okay, so I'm in a I'm in a fight, and it's not a tank or a, a rifle. It's not a grenade launcher. None of those things are going to help me. I, I've got a different weapons, Lord. Yes, different weapons. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds, Jebusitis. Come on, smile at me. What's a stronghold? This is worth writing down what I'm about to say. Just give you a pointer. A stronghold is a mindset. I probably should have put it in your notes. I've said it a hundred times here, at least. It's a mindset. It's a set way of thinking impregnated with hopelessness that's contrary to what God's Word says. So when you have a way of thinking and that way of thinking is surrounded even by hopelessness and it's contrary to truth. In other words, it's a lie. Strongholds are lies. And so when you have a lie about yourself or a situation or somebody else, you've got a Jebusite up in your head. So what does the Lord say? The Lord says, you need to tear those things down because it'll keep you from progressing. It'll keep you from possessing the land. It'll keep you from getting it or done. Don't tolerate it. Deal with it. Some of you might be struggling with a habit pornography maybe maybe it's drug addiction or alcoholism maybe it's just I don't know you may fill in the blank greed lust fill in the blank some people most people I found most people in the body they have no clue of who they really are and so really they 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 base their confidence on maybe their education or their looks or they base their confidence on on how they feel about themselves and maybe how they've lived their life maybe up to that point. Really, your confidence needs to come from your identity in Christ. So if you have a stronghold, a mindset, a way of thinking that's impregnated with hopelessness contrary to the Word of God, then you tear it down. Well, how do you know what that is? Well, when you get discipled and you read the Word and you grow and you get in a small group or you get in a ministry and you start growing in God, He'll reveal things to you. Like all of a sudden, oh, wow. Or you'll say things like this. Prepare, be prepared to be convicted. You ready? You'll say things like, oh, I'm so stupid. You are? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you're stupid. If you think yourself stupid, you are incorrect. You say, but I didn't do good in school. That has nothing to do with intelligence. But God made you the way he made you. And so, the, so you, you just have to come to grips with, you're a divine original. After they made you, they broke the mold on purpose you're the best you there will ever be so a, a stronghold would be and I used to have this I used to hate myself and so I would think man I'm such a loser and, and man I had a list of stuff to prove my loser traits and I would rehearse so the enemy would rehearse them for me you did this you did that you did this you did that I'm like yeah I'm a loser <gasps> I'm a loser I mean we're talking serious depression I, I couldn't hardly get out of it then I started reading the Word. And I had people tell me, Oh, did you know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Did you know that you're God's expression of, of righteousness in the earth? And I'd be like, <laughs> I think the Lord messed up on that one right there. I think He messed up on that one. No, 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 no. You're the one that's messed up. You've got a thought pattern. You've got something that's elevated against the Word of God. You need to tear it down. And they told that to me. And I thought, what? Tear it down? They said, yeah, let me pray for you. And they'd pray for me. And I'd start saying things like, I'm a victor, not a victim. I can overcome. I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I started realizing that I don't have to stay in a ditch. I'm not a dirtbag. I'm not a loser. I'm a son of the Most High God. That he loves me, died for me, rose again from the grave for me. He lives on the inside of me. Nothing's impossible for me. Nothing's impossible to them that believe. You can do all things. Great exploits God will do for them that know their God. 
great exploits. Amen. Can jump over a troop, run through a fence, cast out devils, lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Can somebody say amen in here? You can get it done. You can take the land. We can see revival. We can see a great move of God. You just have to settle it deep down in your mind and get your mind renewed to know that He's chosen you. He's chosen me. Why? Because the world is desperately in need of somebody who can bring the kingdom. Not religious people. We don't need any more of that. We need the power of the kingdom of God. We need somebody who can lay hands on somebody and say, you know what? I know God. He can, he can heal you in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Boom. People get healed. Things will happen. Come on, somebody say, get her done. Come on, stand up on your feet and say, get her done. Get her done. Woo! Put your hands together for Jesus. All right. Let's see if we got any strongholds. Ask the Lord to reveal to you in your life right now, in, in your mind, in your thinking. ways of thinking that are contrary to his word ask him to show you right now you just ask the lord right now ask him she's like yeah pastor too many to name all right we'll just keep coming start reading the word get plugged in grow the problem is in america we have a whole bunch of unbelieving believers they say they believe in God, but they've never really, they've never really been discipled. They've never really grown in the things of God. And so when an obstacle comes, they crumble, they fold, they fail, they go back to alcohol, they go back to manipulation, they go back to stuff. As opposed to standing there, declaring the word of the Lord and see things changed. Living a life of integrity and character and honesty and morality based upon the word of God. Not based upon what you think is moral, based upon what God says is moral in his word. Holy Spirit, I pray now for your beautiful, wonderful people who you died and rose again for, that you would reveal to us, reveal to us now by your Spirit, places in our lives that displease you, places that are like Jebusites camped out on the land. Lord, we don't want anything like a Hivite, a Perizzite. It just doesn't sound good. I, I don't want anything like that encamped on territory that you promised me that you promised us. Lord, we commit today forgetting that which lies behind and pressing on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We commit today to possess the land, to fulfill the call of God individually. Come on, tell them. Just let a yes be in your spirit. I commit today to fulfill your plan. Lord, I'll not shrink back. Come on, tell them. I'll not shrink back. I won't quit. No matter what, to fulfill what you've called me to do in the earth. For the glory of God, by the strength of your spirit. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being alive right now. And having scales fall from our eyes that what you have for us is far greater than the compromise of our sin and allowing, tolerating things that you want to deliver us from. So release faith and courage and strength right now. A revelation of authority and the power of prayer, the power of your you'd raise up a mighty army that would not shrink back until we see revival from sea to sea, from coast to coast, from nation to nation to the fullness of the Gentiles, to the sound of the trumpet, the twinkling of an eye and we'll give you praise in Jesus name, amen. Put your hands together for Jesus if you're not right with God, if you're if you were to die, God forbid, today, it would be your last day on the earth. If you died today, do you know for sure whether you would go to heaven? If you're not sure, if you're not certain, if your sins are forgiven, you can be. All you need to do is receive Jesus. Very costly for him, but it's free for you. It's a gift. It's called grace. 
If you've never received Jesus, never asked him to forgive you, confessed your sins to him, asked him to forgive you, to come into your heart, to come into your life, won't you do it right now? If you've drifted in your walk with the Lord, won't you come home today? Pray with me, won't you please? All out loud, even for those who are on fire, affirm your faith. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for rising again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin and come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray. Fill. Touch. Break every chain. Break every bondage. Break addiction. Break even a religious spirit off of people. Lord, those that are bound even by religion and tradition. Free. Free people today. And fill them full of your spirit. Give them the prayer language, God. Give them the gifts of the spirit. That everywhere we go, we walk with you, abiding with you, bringing forth fruit and fruit that remains. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.